Alrighty, welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. I'm so excited that we are all here today. This week's Torah portion is what we call a double portion. It is Matas and Masse, which is also Shabbos Chazak, because this week we complete the fourth book of the five books of Moses. We complete the entire book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, and then next week we start the fifth and final book, the book of Devarim in English, Deuteronomy. So it's an exciting week whenever we get to do the completion of a book, whenever we get to do Shabbos Chazak, it's an extra strength. So hopefully everyone's going to be able to join us on Shabbos. But I'm very excited to speak today about one of the episodes that take place. So what happens over here? In essence, the way that the Torah is split, we're not going to get into the details now, but the first book, the book of Genesis, speaks of the creation of the world and then everything up to Moses, basically. Then the book of Exodus is really Moses' book where he speaks, where we have the entire exile into Egypt, and then of course the redemption, and then the giving of the Torah, Mount Sinai. And with that, we start our journey in the 40 years of the desert. We come to the book of Leviticus, which is a little bit of a side in the historical context. It's primarily focused on the temple and the sacrifices and the service in the temple. And then we get back to the book of Numbers, book of Bamidbar, when we are continuing and in essence finishing our 40 year journey in the desert. We have some of the episodes that took place all the way in the beginning, and then primarily the episodes that are taking place right before the Jewish people enter the land of Egypt, of Israel, excuse me. And this is actually the last week uh, in that episode because we are here standing right by the crossing of the Jordan River. After 40 years of awaiting, we are finally about to cross the river and enter the promised land. Reminds me of a, what, what we're about to talk about reminds me of a good joke. Of there was a family that owned a farm, a Canadian family that owned a farm right by the border with North Dakota. And there was a dispute over this property for many, many years, whether it belonged to the United States or to Canada. And uh, there was the matriarch of the family, just turned 90, and she lives on the farm, and her son, and some of her grandchildren. And one day her son comes so excitingly to her and says, Mom, guess what? There's finally good news. In Washington, they made an agreement. We're actually part of the United States. Should we take the deal? Mom's like, 100%, jump on it. I am sick and tired of these Canadian winters. <laughs> so... Uh, Obviously, when we think of borders, there is different circumstances where they have different meanings. Sometimes they are very meaningless, but sometimes they are very, very important and meaningful. And in regards to the Holy Land, it is absolutely meaningful. When God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he's going to give his descendants the promised land, there is a very specific promise over here. And that's why, while they were traveling in the desert, they didn't just decide, oh, maybe over here should be the promised land. No, God said to go to a certain location, and that's where it's going to be the promised land. And that's where we're standing, where suddenly, what episode comes around? The tribes of Reuven and Gad. I mean, I was have to say those tribes in English. Is it just Reuben and Gad? Reuben and Gad. Okay, Reuben and Gad. I'll just stick with the Hebrew. It's close enough. Um, and also, there's more half the tribe of Benasha, but I don't want to make it confusing. Let's just simplify it. The tribes of Reuven and Gad. They turn to Moses and they say, "You know, we have so much cattle, and I don't know, for the women, for the children, it's just so challenging to keep traveling. Can we settle right here, right before we cross the Jordan River?" Which, if we just think about it is already an odd request. Like, you've been traveling for 40 years, we're about to cross to the promised land, and right before we get the grand prize, you wanna cancel the whole idea, just settle here? Of course, Moses' response was very hesitant about it, primarily because he didn't want it to seem that they're afraid, which may be the reason, actually, that they don't wanna go in. They're afraid to go in, they're gonna have to fight with all these nations, and who knows what's gonna happen. Or maybe that, and therefore he was very hesitant that not only it will be negative for them, but all the rest of the Jewish people will see that these two tribes are having hesitation about going in, and they may not want to go in either, and this will be like, a, you guys remember the story of the spies? This will be like that once again, when right now we're, after 40 years of having to rectify for the sin of the spies, that's why we spent so many years in the desert, something so similar happened when they were like, no, 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 we don't want to go in, and we got so punished, and now we're about to do the same thing, so the, it, very, very negative implication to the request, and Moses was very hesitant to fulfill the request. And what's the end of the story? That they basically make a deal. They say, no, 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 we're not afraid, don't worry, we're ready to come in and help, whatever is needed. We'll leave our cattle and our wives and children here. We'll leave. We'll come with you to help conquer the land, split the land, settle the land, and then we'll go back to our families. Anybody here knows how long that took? That took 14 years. So all the men from these tribes were away from their families for 14 years. That is a tremendous amount of time. Just what? To settle over there? The whole thing is a little strange. So there's a lot of different commentaries that give explanations, some arguments, some agreements, on what is the reasoning behind what's taking place over here. There are some scholars that right away say that it's actually not that they wanted to um, not go into the promised land, but rather this is part of the promised land. So they wanted to settle in already a section of the promised land, just maybe the section that was closer. And, but even that, I mean, like, yes, maybe, but it doesn't say that clearly, number one. And number two, 
that's still like, why don't they go to their mainstream promised land? Why are they looking to go to some <laughs> potentially part of the promised land? It just, it just doesn't, seem, doesn't seem very, very, very clear. So in a most amazing talk of the Rebbe, he adds an entirely new dimension to this whole episode and the reason that the tribes of Reuven and Gud wanted to settle over there. Okay, what happens over here? God promised Abraham the land of how many nations? Anybody here knows? The land of ten nations. Ten. How many did the Jewish people go to at that time and with Joshua end up settling in, conquering, and so on? Seven. Very good. Land of seven nations. What's going on over here? So there's a famous verse in the Torah which says, God is going to broaden or widen your boundaries. Because right now we're only doing the seven. At a later point, you're going to get the other three. Anybody who knows when that is? When Mashiach comes. In the time of the future, that's where we're going to have the whole land. But as of now, we only get the land of the seven. It's a complicated topic in general when you speak of the boundaries of, of the land of Israel. Um, there's obviously the primary conquering of the land, which was the time right after Moses with Joshua. Then there was a whole episode of King David, which gets its own category. It's not considered part of the holy land in the regular sense. Then you have when the Jewish people came back from exile with Ezra, and they kind of reconquered what they originally did with Joshua. Um, and then you have the actual promise, which is the whole ten lands, which we never had. We're only going to have in the future, in the time of the redemption. Um, so when they were going in to conquer the seven lands that God wanted them to conquer then, not the whole ten, the tribes of God and Ruvain, they said, one second. I know that right now we're only going to be getting the seven nations, but the other three, the, the lands of Kini, Knizi, and Kadmoini, that's the name of them, which were for the nations of Edom, Amoin, and Mayav. Those are the three nations. But though that part we're not getting now, but perhaps maybe we could already kind of accomplish and bring about this final redemption already sooner. Why do we have to wait thousands of years, perhaps, go into Israel, be exiled, have the destruction of the temple, which is interesting that we're mentioning that now, because now we're in the time period of the three weeks, which is a time of mourning over the destruction of the temple, which just a week ago is when we had that they broke in to the wall of Jerusalem, and in about a week from now is when we're going to have Tisha B'Av, the saddest day on the Jewish calendar, when they actually destroy the temple. Why do we need all that? And then years of exile, and then we'll come back and then we'll get it? Maybe we could, we could accomplish now to cause that we should already have the whole land, and in essence, have the final redemption, have the coming of Mashiach. Which, by the way, Moses when God sent him to redeem the Jewish people from Egypt, had a similar request. He turned, by the burning bush story, he turned to God and said, what are you sending me? Send your final redeemer, send Mashiach. And in essence, God said, now is not the right time for that, we're not there yet, but your request is going to have a, it's going to accomplish something, but not actually bring the Mashiach now, but when I, we'll save that for a different time, what ended up being accomplished through Moses' request. But in a similar vein, that's what these tribes wanted to do, which is a fascinating idea that the Rebbe is taking over here. Because he is taking something, which if you look at the more simple commentary on the story over here, what the Ruvain and Gud, what those tribes wanted to do, was a negative. Whether it was bad or not bad, it was a negative. It was whether you're going to call it laziness, whether you're going to call it uh, fear, whether, whatever you're going to... Arrogant. arrogant. Whatever title you're going to put to it, it was something negative about it. And the Rebbe flips on his head. No, it was the most positive thing. They were doing this because they wanted to accomplish the purpose why the whole world was created. They wanted us to finally be in the state of the final redemption, of the coming of Mashiach. They didn't want us to have this whole lengthy process. It tr flips it on its head and puts a positive note to the whole idea. And this is why it's so related to the fear was it would be similar to what the spies did 40 years ago. This is actually the opposite. It's repenting for what the spies did 40 years ago. In general, in the concept of repentance, or in the Hebrew word for that is tshuva, which literally means to return, we know that a big concept of repenting, or teshuva, is that when you have the same situation, circumstance, and you refine it, you do it right this time. I mean, in the simple sense of yesterday you ate a fruit and you forgot to make a blessing, and then you eat it today and you make a blessing, you kind of rectify it. That's like tshuva. In a more, in a more uh, nuanced or complex or uh, wholesome <laughs> manner, perhaps it's not just, you know, you didn't do it then, you do it now but there, it's more that the opportunity brought you to this place is actually a famous story of the great sage Rabbi Akiva, who I think the way that the detailed story goes is he would debate sometimes Romans, um, maybe some Romans philosophers or scholars, and uh, he would win the debates very often. And one time there was a big guy that he won the debate and he was very obsessed. So he said, what can I do? So he went home and spoke to his wife. Let's think of a plan. What, how do we get back at Rabbi Akiva? And um, what they came with the plan was his wife was a very pretty lady. And he said, oh, and they came with the plan that she'll try to uh, seduce him and uh, try to get him to commit a sin. And that will be, of course, a great embarrassment for him. So a very pretty lady comes and whatever, wherever Rabbi Kiva is, walks by this, that. And Rabbi Kiva's response was he spat, he cried, and then he laughed. 
So she realized that he understands what's going on. So she came up to him and said, what's going on over here? Why, do you, why, why did you spit? Not at me, but on the ground. Why did you spit? Why did you cry? And why did you laugh? So uh, he says, I spat because I remember first and foremost that, you know, we're all humans, which means we came from dust, we're going to return to dust, and we're, we're, we're like nothing. So the, the, the fact that there is something exciting, perhaps, or pretty in front of me is, 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 is not uh, important. It's not the importance of life. It kind of reminds us of the humility that we have to all have. I cried because I saw a pretty person, and I knew that eventually you're going you're gonna to be passing away at some point, and so that, that made me sad. And the reason I laughed, I can't tell you. She um, heard this and was extremely inspired by it, that she ultimately ended up becoming very close to God because of it, and she actually converted, and she actually ended up marrying Rabbi Akiva later on. And when she married him, he said, now I can tell you the reason I laughed is because I saw the ending of the story that I was actually going to end up with you, but in a kosher manner and not in an inappropriate manner. So that's the kind of this idea, a little bit. It reminds me of it. It's a little different, a little, a little similar also, that on one hand, she came to do a sin, but they rectified it, and they ended up not doing the sin, but on the contrary, they only did the... Anyways, back to our... Uh, Story over here. The spies did a negative thing, not going into land. They took that and wanted to repent it, so they also didn't want to go in, quote-unquote, into the land. But what did they end up doing? They were doing it in a positive way for a positive reason to cause and bring about the ultimate redemption, the coming of Mashiach. So it's repenting in the fullest sense for the sin of the spies. Doing the same thing, but for good reason. So it's not... What they wanted to do, again, is instead of just getting the land of the seven nations that the Jewish people are now are about to conquer, but let's get the whole land, the whole promise that God promised our forefather Abraham, all ten nations. When that will be complete, that's obviously going to be the time of the true and complete redemption. Now, it's interesting on two, just two small notes that where they were was the other side of the Jordan River. So that was kind of taking, just broadening the boundaries. Forget about where it is necessarily. It's just the concept. But also, interestingly enough, I'm not fully, uh, the, 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 the exact boundaries I, I'm not, I don't have 100% clarity on, but I'm pretty sure that this is actually in the boundary of some of those three additional nations. It's a little more south, I think, the majority of it, but I do think over there is, is part of these extra three. That's what led to the uh, argument. To stress the point, it's important to realize that ultimately what these tribes were doing, if you look, realize the way we're looking at it now, that's not a negative but a positive, was actually great self-sacrifice. Because they left their families, for example, for 14 years. That's very challenging. That's not the easiest thing to do. They didn't settle in the mainland. They weren't doing the in thing. That's a little bit perhaps challenging for some people to not do the main thing, the in thing to do. But they were doing this all because they wanted to reach this final redemption. And Moses responded in kind. He said, you know what? I'm going to agree with you guys. Okay, some caveats, some uh, stipulations, but I'm going to agree with you guys because he also wanted to do this reaching of the final redemption. It's interesting because... We read in last week's Torah portion that God had Moses go on a mountain and he showed him the land. And it's, it's related to an interesting concept in Judaism, and that is that anything in Judaism is from Moses. For example, Moses got the Torah. Now, any new Torah that happened later on, when I say new Torah, that means a new understanding of Torah, a deeper reasoning in Torah, a, a new revelation in Torah, all of it is, was given to Moses at Mount Sinai and in some fashion. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but it all comes from him. There's no Torah that's not associated with Moses. If yes, that's not Torah. Everything is associated with him. Similarly, in every other aspect in Judaism, the land as well, the same thing. Even though he never went into the land, but he had to see the land. And his going into the land, it says it gave it a certain sense of, of acquiring it by him just seeing it. What did he see? He didn't only see the land of the seven. He saw the whole land. He saw the land of all ten nations, which again, we're only going to have it by the future redemption. But as part of kind of Moses wanting, not want, doing his job to allow them to settle there, he was pushing for what? For this Mashiach's coming, the final redemption, to happen even sooner. Now, what's interesting, in this part of the land, so we said it was the tribes of Reuven and Gad, there was also half of a tribe, half of the tribe of Menashe, which is interesting, their story, because they didn't ask to be there. Moses basically told them or suggested to them to, that they should stay there. So they had half in the regular land and half in this part of the land, which is a whole separate interesting story. But there was also, you know who else was there? Anybody knows? There was a portion of another tribe of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Levites, because we, they didn't have a part of land. And uh, actually, some of the places where they settled were the, what's called Ari Mikla, the land of refuge. And some of the land of refuge were here, which is very interesting because Maimonides brings that, in general, this whole topic of the final future redemption and coming of Mashiach, which is a foundation in Judaism, Maimonides puts it as one of the 13 principles of faith. You know, you got to believe in God, so you got to believe in the coming of the redemption. The whole concept is spoken about at great length in the Tanakh, in scriptures, but it's mainly in the book of Nevi'im and Ksuvim, the prophets and the writings. In the five books of Moses itself, the Torah, there's only three places where it's spoken about. 
And one of the three that he brings is the mitzvah of our Ir Miklat, of the cities of refuge. Because God promised that there's going to be more cities of refuge. We didn't get it yet. Where is it going to be? It's going to be in the additional lands that we're going to get when Mashiach comes. That's like an interesting side note. Uh, was there a uh, city of refuge in that era? Yes. In the, in the, yes. Part of the land. Yes. So Hashem approved the movement. Oh, of course the move. Every, every, mo every movement of Moses was approved by God. It's Absolutely. Like the same for our city. That's exactly what it is. Okay, so let's, to conclude, of course, what's most important is the lessons for us. So first and foremost lesson we got to take from this tribe that they did major self-sacrifice in order to what? In order to try and bring Mashiach, try and bring about the ultimate redemption. We too have to do everything in our power to bring Mashiach to bring the ultimate redemption, firstly. Secondly, of course, preparing to enter the promised land starts with our personal redemption. We have to first worry and take care of ourselves. How do we do that? By doing another mitzvah, by doing another good deed, by doing another thing that God wants us to do. That's how we redeem ourselves and ultimately bring the redemption to the whole world. But perhaps an additional lesson we can learn from this is like the Rebbe takes this story, which seems like a negative, and flips it on its head to show how it's the most positive thing. When we look at others, maybe we should start seeing the positive a little more. Not only seeing the negative, which oftentimes is the first thing we see, but try. Maybe it's hard. Try to see how it could be a positive. I'll finish off with a, with a nice story that I heard. It was a, I don't remember the guy's name who said the story, um, but he said, whatever, random. He was in a fruit store and he has his grapes and his onions and potatoes ever since his cart and he sees someone else come in the store and takes a grape and like tastes it and a second grape and a third grape, which, you know, sometimes a kid does that, you know, as we say in Mela, you know, okay, it is what it is. But an adult, I mean, you didn't pay for it. What are you doing? So he starts thinking, obviously, very negative of him. He comes to the cashier to pay, and he puts out all the stuff, and then we put his grapes. The one behind the counter says, did you taste it yet? He said, taste it. No, I didn't pay for it yet. She said, over here, different people are complaining that they want different tastes of grape. We have a new rule in the store that you can't buy the grapes without tasting them first. I don't, we don't want any complaining later. He suddenly realizes that while he's looking at this in a very negative light, really, he's the one that was doing something wrong and thinking bad about someone else for no reason other than the initial reaction that we often have is just a, a negative way to look at things. So I think that lesson is a good way to end this class, of course, with prayers that we should merit to the coming of Mashiach now when we'll have not only the land of the seven nations and not only the part where the tribes of Reuven and God settled, but the entire land that was promised to our forefathers by God Almighty himself, the land of all ten nations, may be speedily now, and we could all say, Amen.